They're giving them eyeballs. They're giving them cancer. They're curing the cancer. They're putting them in mice. Why? Is this a good idea? Do they make good pets? Can they feel pain? Can you put one in my brain? I'm curious about cerebral organoids. Also known as mini brains, they're tiny blobs of real brain tissue that you grow in a lab. It's similar to how you make lab grown meat. If you start with cow cells, you can grow a burger. Start with chicken cells, you can grow a chicken nugget. And if you start with human cells, you can grow a buffet that would make Hannibal Lecter's mouth water. You can grow the raw materials for any organ if you know the recipe. You've grown organs before. When you were just an embryo, you had stem cells that could grow into a brain or lungs or gut, whatever you needed. You just had to give them nutrients, guide them into place, and tell them what to turn into by making growth factors. Then off they go. And you can recreate that magical process in a lab. You don't even need an embryo anymore. They found a way to reprogram adult cells and turn them back into these pluripotent stem cells. So you take a little skin, turn it into stem cells, feed them the right growth factors, maybe spin them around a little bit, and you've got some organoids. If you follow the recipe for cerebral organoids, you'll grow a bunch of neurons that start talking to each other and making brain waves that look like a developing human brain. Specifically, they look like a premature baby around 30 to 35 weeks. Mini brains grow all different kinds of brain cells and they self-organize into complex brain-like structures. You can even see specific regions where certain kinds of cells are dominant. Some look like the cells in prefrontal cortex, others look like the cells in the hippocampus, and you get these regional boundaries that resemble the divisions in the brain. But you can't grow a whole brain in the lab yet. Without the rest of the embryo guiding the development of these areas, they form haphazardly. It's similar to how snowflakes form. A lot of snowflakes have six sides because they're built on this base of six water molecules in a hexagon, and that shape gets magnified as it picks up more water. But there's a lot of randomness in the process of snowflake formation. You're randomly bumping into water vapor, and it crystallizes differently depending on conditions like temperature and humidity, and tiny little differences between two snowflakes early on will get amplified as they grow. That's why no two snowflakes are exactly the same, even though they have a similar starting point and follow the same laws of crystal formation. And even though cerebral organoids all look kinda like brains, each one is a special little snowflake that grows a little differently. But under carefully controlled lab conditions, you can make two snowflakes that are more or less identical. And you can even customize them by adjusting the temperature and humidity, which will change the shapes of the crystals. Same thing with mini brains. They make all different kinds of cells and you can tinker with the chemicals and nutrients to encourage certain kinds of cells to develop and create organoids that resemble specific parts of the brain. So why are they making these mini brains? Well, they make great models for studying brain development and what goes wrong with neurodevelopmental diseases. Some diseases, like microcephaly, are unique to humans, so animal models don't work very well. That's why they made the first human mini-brains, to see how the microcephaly gene impacts brain development. They took some skin cells from a patient with microcephaly, turned them into brain cells, let them develop, and then compared them with neurotypical organoids. Another group of researchers took cells from patients with Rett syndrome, and their mini-brains had these seizure-like spikes in electrical activity like you see in the disease. They used these mini-brain models of Rett syndrome to test an unconventional drug, and it worked. It reduced these spikes and brought their brain activity a lot closer to the normal mini-brains. That's a lot easier and a lot safer than using real patients to test every new drug. Mini-brains are also being used to test cancer treatments. You can take a sample of cancer cells directly from a patient, and they'll happily grow all over an organoid if you put them together. Then you can see how well that specific cancer responds to different treatments. This is a big advantage since even two of the same kinds of tumor from different patients might respond differently to treatments. This study showed that a chemotherapy drug worked on one patient's tumors but didn't work for another's. These drugs have major side effects, so if you can test them on a personalized mini-brain like that, you could make cancer treatment way more efficient with way less unnecessary suffering. So many brains could be huge for medicine and drug research. Psychedelic drugs are some of the most powerful tools for altering consciousness, and there's growing evidence that they can treat mental disorders like depression and addiction. But we don't know much about how they work in the brain. 
So they dosed many brains with 5-MeO-DMT and looked for the molecular mechanisms. They found increased expression of proteins involved in learning and forming new neurons, and reduced expression of a receptor associated with addiction. So mini brains might help us figure out why your friend stopped smoking cigarettes after he did ayahuasca in Peru, but they don't explain why he's still so annoying. So mini brains are really promising for brain research. And you know what else is part of the brain? I'll give you a hint. Here's the baseline activity level of two different neurons in a mini brain. They're firing electrical signals on a regular basis, either all the time or every few minutes. But if you shine a light on them, they get real quiet. That's because they grew photoreceptor cells, just like the ones in your eyes. Your retina is a little bit of your brain peeking out, so the recipe for mini brains also makes these cells that respond to light. One study found that after six months of development, 65% of their organoids had grown photoreceptors. Another research team added some ingredients to try to promote the growth of eye cells. And not only did they get the cells, but they self-organized into these eye-looking structures, and they had features consistent with the early stages of eye development. These organoids were also sensitive to light, but the authors were disappointed that they started dying after 60 days, before they could develop fully grown retinal cells. So they want to find ways to keep them viable for longer. Is there any chance we can not do that? How long do we need to grow these things for? Do we have to keep them alive until they grow actual human eyes? Let's say they did grow a mini brain with fully grown eyes. Would it be able to see? Would it be thinking, whoa, it's bright, whoa, it's dark. Hey, what are we doing? Why are you putting me in a centrifuge? Hey, can you bring my phone? Probably not, yet. But these are cells that could grow into a real human brain under the right conditions. And the plan is to make organoids that are more and more similar to the human brain so we can model diseases and stuff. So if we keep making progress, we'll eventually make organoids that can see or feel or suffer. And how would we know if we did? You can't just ask them. Hey, are you conscious? Neuroscientists are trying to find the signatures of consciousness in the brain. They're not just looking at areas like visual cortex that are specialized for processing sensory information. Your sensory cortex can process something without you being conscious of it, like when you get a subliminal message. To try to measure consciousness, they're looking at how different brain areas talk to each other. The more tightly integrated the brain is as a whole, the higher it scores on the consciousness meter. If there's a little firing here and there, but the brain areas aren't really talking to each other, the brain probably isn't conscious. But if there's a lot of crosstalk and all the areas are influencing each other in complex ways, that suggests that the brain as a whole might be conscious. And there's some evidence of this in humans. You can get a rough estimate of brain integration with a method called zap and zip. It's like ringing a bell and seeing how long it reverberates, except instead of a bell, you ring the brain. You zap the brain with an electromagnet and record its response with an EEG. Then you see how complex the brain response was by compressing the EEG data the same way you would a zip file. Methods like the zap and zip can tell if you're awake or asleep or dreaming, if you're under anesthesia, and they've even shown promise for identifying people with locked-in syndrome who are fully conscious even though they're totally paralyzed and unable to communicate. We want to know if we're creating organoids that can feel things. Unfortunately, the zap and zip is just a prototype and we can't calibrate it to measure consciousness in mini brains. But fortunately, mini brains don't have all the diverse and interconnected brain areas that support human consciousness. Even so, some consciousness researchers want to play it safe. Neuroscientist Christoph Koch says we should give some organoids anesthesia just in case they're suffering. And philosopher Thomas Metzinger wants us to pause all research that runs the risk of creating conscious beings until we figure out what's going on. But if you're a mad scientist, you're not going to let a couple of nerds tell you what to do. You're going to keep grafting organoids together into frankenbrains and making sensory motor organoids with motor neurons that trigger muscle contractions, and you're going to inject them with Botox so they stop moving. And it's all for a good cause. We've never been able to study disorders like Rett syndrome and ALS in this level of detail before. But if you put all the pieces together, you'll get a mini brain that can sense and move its muscles and basically has an AI inside it. Neurons are pattern recognition machines, and a lot of machine learning is inspired by brain networks. 
They map inputs onto outputs by changing the connections between nodes in a network. AI wishes it was made of neurons, but neurons are way more complex than we understand. To model a single cortical neuron, these researchers needed a deep neural net with up to 2,000 nodes. The current generation of organoids can have something on the order of a million neurons, and they're getting bigger, so that's a lot of computing power. And if they make these frankenbrains that can learn and interact with their environment, that's a recipe for the kind of complex, integrated brain activity associated with human consciousness. But maybe that's not so weird. We already do research with conscious beings, lab animals, from mice to monkeys, and we have ethics boards to decide if the risks outweigh the potential benefits of the research. The really weird part is when we put human mini-brains into those animals, which we're already doing, of course. These guys put mini-brains into live mouse brains and they started to merge. Blood vessels from the host brain infused the mini-brain and kept it alive. The mini-brain sent feelers deep into the host brain, developing these long-range connections, the kind that seem important for sustaining human consciousness. And the mini-brain sent signals that were picked up by the host brain. This is why neurons are such good learning machines. They're constantly branching out and looking for new connections. In this other study, they put human organoids in the mouse prefrontal cortex, and it sent projections all the way down to the hypothalamus, which connects the brain with glands that secrete hormones for things like the fight-or-flight response. Then they did a fear conditioning procedure where they played sounds and then zapped the mice with electric shocks. The mice with organoid transplants froze for longer after hearing the sounds, which the researchers interpreted as boosting the fear response. So that's a good sign. If these organoid transplants are already changing their behavior and probably their experience, what else could it do to their minds if we keep going? Ethicists are worried that we might humanize the lab animals or enhance their cognitive abilities to the point where they become more self-aware and possibly start listening to Billie Eilish. We know the brain is really flexible. That's why these organoid transplants could be so useful. Imagine being able to make some of your own brain tissue to replace areas that were damaged by a stroke or getting a railroad spike through your head, and then it becomes integrated and restores brain function. Or what if you could just grow a little extra of your own brain? With the right bioengineering, you could eventually make custom brain grafts that might be able to help you with advanced math, or learning new skills, or even integrating yourself with computers. Maybe you could make your emotional support animals more empathetic. Or you could graft some dog brain onto your cat. The possibilities are endless, and organoid research is accelerating. So let's cure some diseases and hope the Frankenmice don't rise up and take over the world. Because some of them have a score to settle with me. Yes, I put some of your kind in the freezer a long time ago, but remember, I set some of you free. I for one welcome our new mouse overlords, and everyone else, welcome to the future. Thanks for watching.